Okay, we're live. This is ThinkTech on a given Monday morning. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm joined by Ken Schooland, an economist with HPU. And uh, we're, we're here to talk about, um, what do we talk about? Uh, Corona Watch. We're talking about uh, the, the economics of Corona Watch. And uh, it's very important because, you know, people really don't go into the weeds on it. We need to know the details. We need to know the process. So, uh, Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Jay. This is great, uh, great to join you. You know, so we, we hear about, uh, you know, the, the possibility, if not the fact of a recession and or worse. Um, and we hear about, you know, the slowdown because we see, uh, you know, people aren't coming in. They've, they've been told not to come in. They're not having gatherings and gatherings are economic activity. And so uh, what we have is, a, is it obvious to everybody's, um, you know, uh, everybody knows that uh, there's there's a slowdown going on. But my question to you is how how does that ultimately work? So I don't I don't spend um, you know twenty bucks getting a haircut because uh, barbers are high on the list of risk. They're very close to you. Uh, they may breathe on you. You may breathe on them. Whatever the case may be. So I'm not going to get a haircut, and uh, I'll wait, and I'll wait maybe as long as it takes. I'll wait. I'll get, I'll I'll have long hair like yours, Ken, um, before we're done with this. <laughs> so. Um, now multiply that by millions and millions and millions. And what happens in the economic picture? What happens to the economy if people are not doing transactions for the purchase of goods and services, um, which have been customary, which have, you know, risen all boats in this economy or any economy, all of a sudden, all the boats are, you know, they're quiet. Everything is quiet. Uh, what does that do? How does that work? How does that lead to a recession? Well, <clears throat> actually, you know, we had been under the longest uh, expansion period in uh, post-war era, and it was, uh, I think, for a long time, people were kind of wondering when, when the economy might uh, take a downturn anyway. Uh, so it's entirely unexpected. Some experience in, the 19, uh, in 2001, where 95 percent of the economists at the beginning of the year said we won't have a recession. Even at the end of the year, in September, the majority of economists saying we won't have a recession, and yet The Economist magazine reported we were already in a recession six months before they even recognized it. So economists aren't always right in predicting when the recession is going to be there. Uh, I don't presume to be any different than the, than the other economists, except to think uh, about, about how we would be having things that we don't yet see coming. Now, I think we had such a big boom uh, with uh, the stock market and the housing market and things like that, that, uh, I, that, that frankly, we could have been due for a recession and this just pricked the bubble and, uh, and set things downward. But it's downward in a much, much more rapid uh, pace than we would have ever expected in any other manner. Oh, I'll say, I mean, um, you have every governor every mayor and the president, although he's um, kind of reticent, I was just listening to his, uh, uh, his press conference this morning, and uh, I don't think he's stepping up to this at all, even now, even after the media has been criticizing him to a fairly well. Um, but everybody is saying, don't go in, slow down, don't have gatherings, don't have meetings, don't have ball games, uh, don't, don't do the kinds of things you used to do. And that includes, in very large part, uh, the things that feed the economy, the, uh, you know, the creation of, of goods and services, the acquisition of goods and services, the sale of goods and services. Um, so, and this, it's immediate. This is different, you know, than any recession you and I have ever seen. This is not something that creeps up from behind. This is happening every day. It's only a week or two old. It's crashing, literally crashing around us. And so is the stock market. You know, it's not clear in the stock market crash of 1929 whether the stocks uh, led to the depression or there was an underlying flaw that led to the, you know, uh, the crash of the stock market. But here we have both. And it's hard to say which one came first or which one's affecting, but they're both happening at the same time. And you look around, talk to your friends. Nobody is doing nothing all of a sudden. To me, uh, you know, that is unique and unprecedented. And that could lead to the biggest recession hyphen depression I want to ask you about that. We have ever seen 
this is not only unusual it's unprecedented so query you know how can you get a handle on what is going to happen uh, I, I think a lot of people are stuck in the stock market they you know they're, they're too you know deer in the headlights sort of thing they don't they don't they can't make plans around the stock market so they stay in and 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 one of these days uh, the stock market's going to you know, realize that and the stock market's going to go down much further. Um, so I suspect this is going to make 1929, 1930, 31 look, look like, a, look like, look like easy. Um, don't you? I mean, this is, this is killing us every day. Yes, I agree with you, Jay. Um, and for Hawaii, it's especially hard because we're so dependent on travel and tourism. Those are the first things to go when people get worried and panic. And that has been hit hard already. I think when the data comes out next, we'll see that it was down much, much more, even even much more than what happened after the 9-11. Uh, the and 9-11 was a temporary thing, but this thing is unknown how long it's going to go. I mean, I, I guess you could say there was some uncertainties about the 9-11 era, but this is really unpredictable. If you look back at the Spanish flu, which is often presented as the pandemic that was the most horrendous in the 20th century uh, and of all times, really. Uh, it really came in three stages. Uh, and there was the, the first stage, which was relatively mild uh, in around March of uh, 1918. And then by uh, July, much more, there was a meeting in the in the virus led to a much more serious outbreak and uh, much higher death toll. And then it was followed by a third mutation in December, which was even worse. So uh, what they say about the coronavirus is that it is um, a mutatable virus, um, highly mutatable, and that if if they contain it as it is and come up with vaccines, okay, we could be out of this uh, maybe within a month or, or maybe two. But if it if there are variations that come up, uh, and that could be worse. Even it's possible that we could uh, this could go on an unlimited or an indefinite period of time. And that you're right. I think uh, with those kinds of of um, worries then it would certainly be worse or as bad could be as bad as the great depression i'm not saying that as such because i don't have the evidence of it i'm just saying that when you look at the possibilities out there uh it's a complete unknown yeah well i mean you talk about the um the spanish flu of 1918 19 and so forth that was really interesting i mean um arguably that was also a mutation um, but I think what happened is it, 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 it grew, it started, uh, patient zero was here in the Midwest in I think Kansas, uh, in the United States. And then we had the war we sent all these troops over to Europe and they carried among them and they had training camps, right? And the training camps, uh, propagated the virus. Um, and then the troops exactly. went from the training camps to Europe where they propagated the virus in Europe. And that, then it gets really interesting Then it, it softened a little. Uh, but it was already in Europe, might have mutated, and it might have just been another wave, you know, another, another, mm, another wave of virus coming back when the troops came back in 1918, 1919. And so now the U.S. had another, another epidemic. The U.S. started it, and the U.S. caught it on the way back. And so you have a combination of this, this global travel um, plus you know, bad uh, hygienic conditions, plus um, the mutation effect that you talked about. Uh, it, was, it was really bad and it had a profound, I agree, it had a profound effect on the economy for some time. And it's an interesting model to drive from because we could have, maybe in different degrees, but we could have that kind of experience now. But one of the things you mentioned, which I, which, uh, I wanted to dwell on a little bit was tourism. We have a mono economy here. Try as we, we have uh, since John Burns to build a, um, you know, a diversified economy. We haven't done that. Nobody will say we've done that. We don't manufacture. Our technology sector is peanuts. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's nothing but uh, importing goods and services for big box stores and a lot of 
people who work in Waikiki. I mean, I, that's oversimplifying it, but that's the essential mono-economy of Hawaii. So if one day, as in 9-11, you stop all the tourism, you get a very sharp decline in the state product, okay? And, and I guess what I'd like to ask you as an economist is that that affects everything because now the average guy who doesn't have a lot of money in the bank, who doesn't have a lot of resources to draw from, um, who may not have enough food in his pantry, uh, has no income. And uh, he was working in the hotel industry, got laid off, or there's not the same level of work, or in the restaurant in industry, all the industries that flow out of tourism. Um, and, and he's in big trouble. So the question is, how does that work? How does that, that, that stoppage filter into other corners of a mono economy? Uh, well, we have many things that are fixed expenses. I mean, we have to pay rent, we have to pay on the loans, and yet our income temporarily drops off. And that's not just for the worker, it's for the, for the business that's trying to uh, keep things together and, and, and pay their workers. And, and they've got at the same time, the customers have stopped coming in. Uh, you know, and there's this this thing. It's a strong motive, I think, for a work for an employer to allow the the, the worker sick leave and uh, to even pay the testing and so on for him because you don't want a worker coming in uh, and bringing uh, disease to the rest of the employees because then they'll all catch it and they'll all have a, this trouble. So you've got these fixed expenses. Uh, but the variable revenue is way off, so yeah, that's that's a, a dire circumstance, and it matters how much time is involved. If it's just one or two weeks, well, that's manageable. And even if it's a very serious depression or, or, or recession, whatever, whatever um, well, the the land, labor, and capital assets are still there. It's just they're not being utilized and productive. And you're right that we've had uh, uh, a monolithic uh, sort of uh, economy that that's not. Uh, hasn't been very flexible. And uh, I, I think that there are certain things that we could do that would make it uh, open and, and flexible. I, I, mean, I, I think uh, when emergencies hit uh, from hurricanes in, let's say, in Puerto Rico, one thing that they wanted to have access to was a lot more from, uh, from in ports, and I think the Jones Act is something that could could figure in here in terms of uh, opening up a lot more opportunities for our agriculture to be able to ship to the mainland. If it was a lot cheaper than uh, you know, with uh, uh, lower cost shipping, we'd have more more longshoremen jobs. If more ships were able to come in and and uh, bring in lower cost things from uh, abroad, I think uh, that would be one way to immediately try to soften the blow of a low economy by bringing in lower cost uh, materials from from a, from the mainland and being able to sell what we produce here on the, on the mainland. Our it's interesting, you know, products, the, I think we're, what you're describing we're, is, um, you know, the future, hopefully, a hopeful future. When we're, when we're done with this, when we've seen the light at the end of the tunnel, when we come out of it, <laughs> uh, then we should address uh, these issues. Hopefully we won't have the same level of incredible complacency uh, that we have had since John Burns. Um, but, but the reality is our leadership in the state has really done very little um, to make us more resilient. And uh, we, we don't have resilience to deal with this or for that matter, any extreme circumstance such as extreme weather in climate change, you know, um, which, which could really devastate us. And we, we don't have um, the self-reliance uh, that you need to be uh, sustainable. But that's not the issue right now. Because right now it's a question of figuring out, you know, a how this is going to how it's going to play out, and uh, and uh, also as you mentioned, how long it's going to take to recover. And it's a very complex questions. So let's take one of them before the break, and that is. <clears throat> so I give you a state where tourism dries up on a very expedited basis, and then all the uh, subsidiary industries of tourism they dry up because there's no tourist to, you know, to, to do trade with. Um, and those people who own those business, worked in those business, uh, they, they have no money. And so the businesses that would support them 
they, they dry up too. It's a chain reaction, isn't it? Um, and so at the end yes. of the day, there are no businesses. Um, and, I, and I just wonder how that works and, and, what, and what the bottom line is. Where do we get to the bottom line? Is it, is it soup kitchen? What is the bottom line? So much depends on how long this uh, this virus uh, uh, has us in a kind of panic. I mean, you, you saw, for example, I don't know if you, I was at the Sam's Club, uh, one at uh, Pearl City uh, over the weekend when there was just a, a rumor that uh, it was a false rumor that uh, that Matson was going to su suspend their uh, shipments for a couple of weeks or so and pe people panicked. Well, even without the rumor about bats and people were panicked about toilet paper and water and then all else that comes along with it. So in a sense, <laughs> there's a there's a blip in terms of a, a huge amount of purchasing because of people are stocking up as we do every hurricane season and the shelves are empty temporarily. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're at the point yet where uh, those supply lines are shut down. Uh, to my knowledge, you know, the, the shipping lines are still open, uh, and Amazon's under tremendous uh, demand to to uh, to deliver. The postal services are delivering, uh, so I'm I'm not at the point of, of feeling desperation yet. But it, as you point on how long this virus, if we if we see that it can be um, finished within a few, you know that it that it. And, and get better, the number of infections goes way down, uh, then that's good news. And then we're back to normal with uh, everybody with a great story to tell. But if it goes on much longer than that, then I think you're you're talking about some real hard times for people where they get the money. And then, uh, well, I, I'd have to say that I'm, I'm, I think that people do have a very good sense of responsibility towards it. I mean, look at the people's already response in terms of social distancing. You know, people have given up uh, the the hugs and the sh handshakes for a, for an elbow budge and uh, a bump and that's not and, necessarily uh, altruistic. That's not necessarily altruistic. They're protecting themselves. They're trying to stay healthy. That's sure. why they do that. Um, and I think it's very interesting. You mentioned uh, you know the, the run on the stores. Uh, for silly toilet paper, for everything and anything that might, uh, you know, allow somebody to uh, maintain a household in the face of a, a break in the shipping line. Uh, but um, reality is it's all motivated by less than altruistic motivations. And that, that gives me great concern about what happens when it gets even tougher. Let's take a, let's take a break. That's Ken Schooland, a professor of economics at Hawaii Pacific University. When we come back, we're going to ask him the most difficult question of all. When it hits bottom, how does the economy knit back together again? How do you start it up from basically uh, the low point? We'll be right back with Ken Schooling. Yeah, we're back with Ken Schooling. And sorry you missed the break, because in the break, uh, Ken pointed out that I was a, a little on the pessimistic side, and he was not nearly so <laughs> pessimistic. What, what is your sense of it? I mean, personally, professionally, Ken. Well, yeah, I, I don't feel uh, uh, that Armageddon has come yet. And I, I feel that uh, people are very, very capable of uh, handling situations there, you know, there's a guy named uh, uh, Robert Lucas who got the Nobel Prize in economics for what he called rational expectations. That despite all of the predictions of the economists about what they think is going to happen with the economy, what the, what isn't going to happen, uh, people manage their their driven their desire to solve problems in, in, into their own conditions and. 
and people in mass they get back to what they were doing before once uh, you know once the coronavirus the big unknown is out of the way yeah that's my I question think, uh, that's my, uh, let's just let's assume we hit bottom wherever that is whether it's soup kitchen or just a, a modest reduction in goods and services and income and disposable income and all that let's assume that somehow this gets saved and i i have a little trouble visioning exactly how that'll happen but now now we're on the way up now the economy is beginning to you know rise again how does that work and here's a big question how long does it take uh, I, I would add that in the 1918 um, flu epidemic, the Spanish flu, it took something like in the order of six or eight months. Um, what are your thoughts on, the, you know, the the recovery, so to speak? Oh, yeah, there were uh, worldwide estimated estimates of uh, anywhere from 20 to 50 million deaths uh, uh, that resulted from that. And in the United States, a half a million, uh, well, 650 thousand people had uh, perished more than than all soldiers in civil war um, and it was a, a terrible experience to, to go through but people bounced right, right back remember we had the the roarings right after that uh, the, the the great thing about the the war was that it it ended and people came back home and they uh, and the, the economy uh, uh, really blossomed and I would say that the, the, the Spanish flu is the worst uh, case scenario uh, because we're, we're also much more adept at, at handling uh, medical circumstances. We can get a, a, a vaccine uh, into action much more rapidly than they had the capacity for in those days. We do have a lot more travel, global and world travel, and so people could take disease uh, all around the planet. They had all then just by the elders going abroad. Um, no, I, I I think people bounce back pretty readily from those circumstances because they're they're they know the way things were. They know how to do business. They know where, uh, what their skills are and how to work. And it's not like they forget all of that when when the virus uh, uh, shuts things down temporarily. Uh, so as an economist, Ken, I think. Ken, think, uh, I think it what, what is your advice to people? You know, I, of course, there's medical advice galore here. Some of it is valid, some of it is not. But what's your advice in terms of economics? Uh, you know, the suggestion or maybe the law is that you close down, shut down, limit. You know, in New York, you can only operate at, at half capacity right now um, in a restaurant. Um, what about here? What, what's your advice to the business person? Uh, what's your advice to the employee? Um, now and when they see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's funny because as I saw the, the headlines about the stock market going down, you know, the stock market now is about where it was. I mean, the Dow Jones is, is about where it was when President Trump took, first took office. So it's lost everything that it had in those uh, three years. Well, it can, and the advice that all of these these uh, pundits are offering is what a great time to buy. The prices are so low. <laughs> and knowing knowing investors in the stock market, that's probably what they're going to do as soon as as soon as things look at, at all um, positive uh, in terms of reducing the numbers of, of uh, infections from the disease. And people to go back and invest in there to get the best price and, uh, and buy back in. This probably is a is a good time for uh, for businesses to borrow money because interest rates are extraordinarily low. If they want to get prepared, and, you know, I I do these surveys in my classroom because every time the attitude towards borrowing and investment or the third prospects is always dependent on the person's own attitude towards risk, and you know, about half that says I uh, borrow more build up uh, the things because things aren't going to be bad forever and then I'll be in a better position. Others will panic and say buy less. And so there's both kinds of personalities and it's uh, they're there. And I, I'd say uh, the, the ones who are, are the bold risk takers are the ones who are going to set things right back on track really quickly and they'll probably come out ahead from the investments that they make. Well, that leads um, to my last question, you know, Ken. My, my last question is this, and this is a really interesting exercise, I think. 
You know, they say that this uh, virus, this is a pandemic, is going to change the world. It's going to change the way people conduct themselves, their social distancing, if you will. It's going to change the way, um, you know, the geopolitics of the relations between nations and states. It's going to change government. Um, the question is, a tough question, how, how is it going to change the economy? When we look down through that tunnel and come out at the other side and we have our recovery, and everybody, including especially the ones who are willing to take, quote, rational risks, end quote, um, how is it going to be different? How is the business world going to be different? How is the economy going to be different? And how is the relationship of business and people and the government, if you can see how this works, how is that all going to be different? I'd like to think that governments will be more cautious in the future about spending everything they possibly can. I would like it if, you know, when, when the state government has a huge surplus budget, that they put money aside or they cut taxes rather than, you know, in other words, build up the reserve so that if there's an emergency in the future, they've got a buffer to, to, to take care of it. I wish that we had control of what, what are called these, uh, 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 oh, what is it, when it, when a hospital can't open up uh, because oh, sir, they need certificates of need. We have a, probably the, the fewest um, hospital beds uh, available in the country because these certificates of need allow one hospital to prevent another hospital from, uh, from uh, opening up and competing with them. And that sort of thing uh, restricts our, our supply so that when we have a crisis, there's, we're, we're less flexible, less able to handle these things. With the federal government, you know, the Federal Reserve lowered their interest rates to zero. Well, I, I'd wish that they were not operating at near zero for the last 10 years so that this zero meant something, you know. It, uh, they, when they're always on this uh, boom, spend everything possible attitude, and then, then there's much, not much of a buffer left. I mean, you know, they're, they're going to borrow more money, and, and, uh, and uh, I, I, I just wish that the governments would be a little more cautious during the good times. Well, I hope we learn from that, this. You know, it's so easy to forget when you're not under pressure. And, uh, you know, it's a sign curve of remembering and forgetting, remembering and forgetting. Um, anyway, I, I, you know, I would like to rejoin this conversation with you. Uh, we're, we're out of time right now. Um, but uh, in the next few weeks, I'd like to pick up where we left off today and, uh, and, and take another look at the economy and the economic indicators and figure out um, how far we've gone and where we're going and when we'll come back. Thank you, Ken Schoolin. Appreciate your time. Stay healthy. You too. Stay healthy. Yours in Purell. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. Yeah. Thanks, one of the, one of the reasons fun. one of the reasons I want to come back with you is that the, your sound was up and down. And I don't know why. It could be that um,